Biogeography is an interesting term, and it really does help highlight a lot of the evidence for evolution. I've been searching for videos online to tell a little more about biogeography, but since this is something that's very close to my heart, I decided I wanted to make a video of my own. Of course, I'll remind you of this quote, which I think really helps to highlight what is important about understanding evolution because it makes everything else in biology make sense. Um, there's no other way to really explain everything that we see in biology from genetics to, as you'll see here, natural history to the similarities between species or the differences between species. There's really no way of doing that unless we understand how evolution works and what evolution tells us. The term biogeography combines the term for life, bio or bios, and geography, which is from Greek for earth description. We're describing the earth here. One particular instance where we would have to incorporate an understanding of life with the understanding of the world is some of our fossils. This is an animal that lived about 200 and... 50 million years ago. It is called Lystrosaurus. It's actually may look something like a reptile. It may have behaved something like a reptile, but it's actually more closely related to mammals. Of course, we would know it from bones, not from actual flesh and blood creatures. But what's interesting about this particular species is we find fossils of it in Africa. We find them in Australia. We find them in Antarctica. This is clearly not an animal that could swim very well or very far distances. So what we would need to do is explain how this animal ended up in three different, fairly well-separated places, along with a variety of other creatures that we see similar patterns in the fossil record. And what we come to understand with looking at these fossils this is our Lystrosaurus, this is the creature that I just showed you, is that many fossils will line up in these sort of arrangements that tell us that the continents were once a lot closer together. You may have heard of Pangaea. If you were at Riverside, I know you learned about Pangaea in fourth grade. And we see these connections between different species that are supported by not only the fossils that we dig out of the rock, but the rocks themselves tell the same story. We see kind of the same repeating story over and over about what different, what the events were that happened in the past. Um, and some of that's supported by fossils, but as you'll see, this is also supported by modern day living things. Really, any of this evidence that we see supports and tells the same story, whether we look at fossils, whether we look at organisms that are alive today, whether we look at rocks that aren't even living, all of these things tell us the same, the same connections, the same patterns uh, that natural history lays out for us and really also tell the story of evolution. As you can see, this, this particular group of fossils, this is a mammal-like reptile, as we call it. This is another mammal-like reptile. This is a fern. Ferns are a very old lineage of plants. And then this is another reptile that lived about 250 million years ago. And these fossils do connect. And they, the simplest explanation for why these fossils are in such wide apart separated locations is because these continents were much once much closer together and these animals which could not swim across oceans had just had to walk from south america to africa or from from africa to india to antarctica that's really the the main message that one piece of evidence for a long history of the earth and an evolution leverage an evolutionary process occurring Again, like I said, Riverside students, and I'm sure most students in Princeton Public Schools would have learned about Pangaea in fourth grade. And this is what the rock evidence, the fossil evidence, as, and as you'll see, even the evidence of animals alive today tell us about 
this particular arrangement of continents. I like to borrow on things that are interesting uh, because they connect to things that we see in our everyday lives. Now, you may remember the turtle in my room in room 287. That is Pinky. Pinky is a side neck turtle. Pinky's neck, when she gets scared, she pulls her neck to the side. She does not have the same arrangement where she can pull her head straight in like many of the turtles that we're familiar with. These are two main groups of turtles that live in the world. And you'll see they have a very unusual arrangement, a very unusual patterning to where they occur in the world. You're familiar probably with a lot of the Cryptodira. These are the hidden neck turtles. These are the turtles that can pull their necks straight back. Crypto means hidden and then deer is neck. So the hidden necks pull their necks in. The Pleurodira put their neck to the side. You're familiar with something like probably the red belly turtle. This is actually a turtle that I tried to save last spring and a, a car rear-ended me. Uh, when I was driving my van, I lost my van as a result. But these are a threatened species in New Jersey. They get fairly large. You can see them in Lake Carnegie. You can see them in the canals. It's the red belly turtle. We also have the eastern box turtle. If you went to Riverside or Johnson Park, you probably know about the box turtles that have been living in those locations. Red-eared sliders, which also pull their heads straight back. Now, they don't aren't supposed to be living in New Jersey, but they do live in... Lake Carnegie and other places because even though they originally came from the Mississippi River area, they are what we call invasive. People caught them in the Mississippi River, kept them as pets, and then let them go in Lake Carnegie. There was a huge, for a long time, a pet trade where people bred and raised red-eared sliders on farms in places like Louisiana, which is close to the Mississippi River, and then they sold them all over the place. You can actually still find them in a lot of places today. If you ever do get a turtle, do not release it into the wild. Please talk to me before you release any turtles into the wild. Our state reptile in New Jersey, the bog turtle, is also a cryptodira. It can pull its head straight back in. It doesn't put its head to the side. The spotted turtle and even giant tortoises will pull their head straight back into their body. They don't. They, they hide their neck. They don't put their neck to the side like the Pleurodira, which is the next group that we will see, which only really occur in Australia, Africa, and South America. In Australia, you have something like the pink belly turtle, which is pinky. That's the turtle you see in room 287. In Africa, you have the African side neck turtle. I've seen them many times available at, at PetSmart as pets. Or we have the Argentine side neck turtle, which lives in South America. All of these turtles pull their necks to the side when they are scared. They cannot pull their neck straight back and pull their head into their body like the cryptodirans can. These are freshwater turtles, which means they could not have swam across the ocean to go from Australia to Africa to South America. The only way that this is possible is that the the continent, the supercontinent of Pangaea, separated about 50 million years after it formed thereabouts. And we had two continents, really. We had what we call Laurasia, which was Europe, Asia, and North America stuck together. And then Gondwana, which broke away, and that was formed with Africa, South America, Antarctica, Australia, India, which was not originally part of Asia, and Madagascar. When these Pleurodiran turtles evolved, that was when Gondwana existed, and the Cryptodiran turtles probably evolved in Laurasia. What happened then was these continents separated, and these turtles actually rode the continents to their locations today. Were there some turtles living in Antarctica? Probably, and they would have gone extinct as the world got colder. We see this pattern when we actually look at their DNA as well. This is a one of many DNA tests, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But the Chelidae are the side neck turtles. The Cheldiridae are the snapping turtles. These are ones that can pull their heads straight back in. But if you notice, all of these cryptodiran turtles, including tortoises, including 
the painted turtles, the box turtles, including the soft shell turtles, including the sea turtles, all of these turtles can pull their heads back in and they are all much they are all more closely related to each other than they are to the side neck turtles, which are on this side. And of course, all turtles are more closely related to each other than they are to these other groups of reptiles and birds and mammals. What this is telling us is that turtles evolved. There was a very primitive form of turtle. And when the continent separated, one type of turtle evolved the ability to pull its head straight back into its body, while the other turtle species never evolved that ability and could only put its head to the side. These are the turtles that we find in places like South America, Africa, Australia, whereas these are the turtles that we find in what used to be Laurasia, which was which was Asia, Europe, North America. Some of these turtles have moved into South America, especially the tortoises. Some of them have also moved into Africa and India. However, the pattern that we see through the fossil record and through certain interesting distributions of reptiles tells us that the, plant, the, the continents were much closer together at one point in their history. We see the same thing with marsupials. Now, I've always liked marsupials. You would know them as the creatures that carry their animals, their babies in a pouch. This is a map that shows where we have the greatest number of species of marsupials. The blue shows very few species or the natural color shows zero species, while as the yellowish to reddish color show where we have the greatest number of marsupial species. Most people don't realize that South America has quite a few marsupials, although we do know about Australia, and New Guinea, which is the island right here to the north of Australia, also has quite a few marsupials. In Australia, we have the more familiar kinds. We have the kangaroos. We have the koalas, which also carry their babies in a pouch. We have the sugar glider, which some people may have as pets, although they are illegal in New Jersey. We have the wombat, we have the numbat, we have the Tasmanian devil. All of these are marsupials that live in Australia. They have relatives in South America. One of them is the Monito del Monte. It's a little, small, opossum-like creature. I actually know someone who, who has these as pets. They're very cute. They aren't the tamest creatures. They do like to, to bite and pee, but they are still uh, quite an interesting creature. We have the water opossum in South America, which is a kind of a strange looking creature. We have one opossum that has moved into the northern hemisphere. It has moved into North America. That's the blue here is what we call the Virginia opossum, which originally evolved in South America. About three million years ago, we see in the fossil record that a lot of animals from North America moved into South America. That includes jaguars. That includes horses. That includes uh, certain types of elephant which were alive at that time. We see a lot of other big cats besides the jaguar as well. We also see animals move north from South America into North America. We see sloths and giant armadillos, giant sloths that were the size of elephants. We also see the opossum for the first time and the nine-banded armadillo moving northward. Virginia opossums have been moving northward ever since, so we have them up into New England, Maine. The armadillos are also moving northward. They crossed into Texas about 100 years ago, and they've spread to Florida. They're spreading up the north. We think that the armadillo will also, which is not a marsupial, but it is a South American species of animal, they will actually live uh, in New Jersey and Pennsylvania within a few years. You might start seeing armadillos in our area. Now, there's the old opossum, and there is the pouch for an opossum. I see opossums in my neighborhood quite often. Uh, I've seen them in Princeton as well. They're fairly common. They are a marsupial, just like the ones that we're more familiar with in Australia. There were other marsupials that lived before humans arrived in Australia and South America. We had, in Australia, a wombat that was basically the size of a rhinoceros, we had a carnivore that was about the size, a little bit smaller than a lion, but it was a marsupial that carried its babies in, the pou in a pouch. In South America, oh, I'm sorry, and in recent history, where 
people were living in Australia and Tasmania, there was this very dog-like looking creature, which is called a thylacine. It went extinct about 100 years ago, although people still today say that that animal is, is possibly living in this island on the south coast of Australia called Tasmania. People say that it could still be living there. Very dog-like looking animal, but it did have its baby in a pouch. It carried its baby in a pouch, and interestingly, the pouch faced backwards, so the baby would actually be sticking its head out that way. This was from a zoo in, uh, in Australia. It's one of the, f- the last thylacines that existed. Unfortunately, they were all hunted. They were thought to be chicken predators, and the thylacines were all pretty much wiped out, unfortunately. In South America, we had other marsupial-like creatures like this giant saber-toothed creature, which was much more closely related to an opossum than it would be related to any big cat like a jaguar or a lion or a tiger that's alive today. And it's not a saber-toothed cat either. It's a saber-toothed animal that's closely related to marsupials that are alive today. If we look at the genetic evidence, the DNA evidence, it kind of does help reinforce the idea that we have South American marsupials that are generally more closely related to each other and Australian marsupials that are generally more closely related to each other. What's very interesting, though, we see these branches. These branches happen much earlier in the South American species. That tells us that actually marsupials got started in South America. If you remember, the continents were fairly close together at one point. Africa broke away early, but South America was connected to Antarctica, which was connected to Australia. That is where many of the marsupials made their transit from South America, where marsupials have been around for much longer, to Australia. The DNA evidence helps support this, as does fossil evidence and rock geology evidence that we see of the time when South America separated from Australia. A lot of the DNA testing that we do and the DNA comparisons look at certain kinds of genes. Now you should be familiar with genes. This is a gene called cytochrome C oxidase. It's an enzyme that's part of the electron transport chain, if you remember cellular respiration. And what we notice, the idea is over time, these genes will mutate. Some of these mutations change amino acids. Some of them are silent mutations, which means there's a letter that switches, but it doesn't actually change the amino acid. If you remember, those three-letter codes for the amino acids, some of them are, are able to code different letter combinations, are able to code for the same amino acid. But what we see is in these DNA gene, in these sequences, the DNA code There's 13 difference between a human and pig, where there's 17 and 20 between a duck and a snake. This would tell us humans and pigs branched more recently than the branch that would have happened between ducks and snakes. Now, you might think this is trying to tell us that ducks are closer to humans than humans are to snakes. That's actually not true, because if you look at the difference between a duck and a snake, there's only three nucleotides that are different. So that means ducks and snakes are actually much more closely related when we do this kind of a comparison. Tuna is very far from really any of these other species. Moths also much farther. As we go, we see more differences in DNA. When we get to yeast, which is a fungus, we have more differences between DNA. That tells us that these species branched farther back. That's exactly the same thing we see here. The more DNA differences we see, the farther back these species branch. So our Virginia opossum, which is up here, Didelphus, is one of the least or one of the oldest uh, parts of the, the marsupial family tree. It's one of the first ones to branch away from the other species of a marsupial. So that... Virginia opossum you might see in, in, in someone's backyard or trying to cross the street late at night is actually one of the oldest lines of marsupials that is still alive today. Now, one thing I did want to add from my own personal research, I've 
done a lot of research. Uh, my my master's degree, I investigated ants and spiders that live on plants and ants that have a relationship with these trees called acacia trees. In South America, there's one kind of ant, or there's several species of ant, but they belong to this group called Pseudomyrmex, which is the, the genus, the 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 genus is the first part of a species name that you would give them. These pseudomyrmix ants live on these acacia trees, which have very pointy thorns. In Africa, there's another kind of ant called tetrapanera, which also lives on acacia trees. Now, these acacia trees aren't exactly the same as the ones you can find in Central and South America, but they do have spines. They do have certain kinds of leaf and... Um, nectar repositories that attract ants to live on them and then the ants will protect their their plants from any kind of of herbivores that might try to come and and steal their their leaves i do have a kind of an interesting experiment to talk about at some point where elephants are shown to be deterred by these kinds of ants in africa whereas these kinds of ants also attack i've been stung many times by these ants but if you look at the dna between these two with the understanding that the more differences in DNA you see, the farther back different species have branched. The story tells us that these two kinds of ants branched about 95 million years ago. That's what the DNA evidence suggests. In addition to that, we look at the rocks in Africa and South America. They tell us exactly the same story, that Africa separated from South America about 95 million years ago, which confirms the same story over and over. So a lot of what evolution predicts is supported by evidence over and over and over again. So people who want to say that evolution is a theory don't really understand that evolution is also one of science's best proved facts. Now, another way that we can look at this is where we have similar environments and similar patterns in evolution. I'll see if I can make sure that this is making some sense. This is a desert landscape in South America, I'm sorry, in South Africa. And this is a desert landscape in Australia. Now, to an observer, if I switched these two and if I told you this was South Africa and this was Australia, you might believe me because they both look like desert. In South Africa, you have a creature that burrows in the sand called the golden mole. In Australia, you have a creature that burrows in the sand called the marsupial mole. They look very, very similar. They live in a very similar environment. So if this idea of biogeography had a problem in it, it would be that you find two species that look very similar in the same environment that are very far apart. Africa and Australia are very far apart. But Africa and Australia separated before we saw much in the way of evolution of, of mammals, at least the mammals that are alive today. So something like this, if it was proved that the golden mole was related to the marsupial mole, that would be a good case against biogeography being a support of evolution. But if we look at the DNA, not only the DNA, but if we look at the structures of these animals, we notice some things. Golden moles, actually their DNA lines up with many other animals in Africa. You'll see a much more recent example of this in a lab that you're going to do hopefully next week but golden moles when we look at their dna they line up with other animals in africa they line up with the tenrex they line up with the elephant shrews if you've ever been i know philadelphia zoo has a couple of elephant shrews they line up with elephants they're much more closely related to elephants than they are to other mammals if we look at the marsupial mole it fits right in here with other Australian mammals. You see it lining up with lots of the famous marsupials. The monito del monte, which I told you in South America. The short-tailed opossum, which is kind of closely related to our Virginia opossum. The numbat, the Tasmanian devil, and the marsupial mole lines up right there. This tells us that these two creatures evolved 
along similar lines only because they were in the same environment. Their relatives and their ancestors looked very, very different, but the environment where they lived had forced them to adapt in very similar ways. I'll also add that speaking of Australia, it has a lot of other creatures that probably were living in much of the world, but they were able to survive in Australia and nowhere else. That includes the platypus and the echidna. Both of these are special because they're the only mammals that still lay eggs. I mentioned very early on in this video that the the mammal-like reptiles, which lived 250 million years ago, probably laid eggs. These are descendants of those very early egg-laying mammals. They managed to survive in Australia and New Guinea, but they were not able to survive in places like South America or Africa, Antarctica, obviously. Nothing lives on land there anymore. Now, one fragment of Australia that broke off about 80 million years ago holds an even more ancient creature called the Tuatara. This is a creature that used to live all over the world 300 million years ago. It's called the Tuatara. It only lives in New Zealand today. I think it's a pretty fascinating animal. It's not related. It looks like a lizard. It's not closely related to lizards. It's not closely related to snakes or crocodiles. It's a completely... If you look at its DNA, if you look at its anatomy, it's a completely different uh, sort of reptile. Very interesting. Very, very much, though, like fossils that we see from 300 million years ago in other parts of the world. It just so happened that it survived in New Zealand and wasn't able to survive anywhere else. The takeaway information, I'm hoping this kind of makes a, a concise, um, makes sense about what biogeography is trying to say. But if we look at evidence from rocks, it tells us the continents moved over time. That is supported by this idea of different animals and different plants occurring in different parts of the world explained by the continents. We have marsupials in South America and Australia, for example, because those two continents were once connected through Antarctica. We see fossils in Africa and India and Madagascar because those places were also connected at one point. These distributions of plants and animals that are alive today are also backed by the DNA evidence that shows, for example, our golden mole, which is the creature that lives in the desert in Africa, is more closely related to something like an elephant because they both live in Africa than it is to the marsupial mole. Even though it looks very similar, the marsupial mole is much more closely related to koalas and kangaroos and other marsupials. That kind of dives into the last part of the information here, where species can evolve similar body plans that are based on their adaptations to certain types of environment. Although the DNA will confirm that live animals living close to each other are usually more likely to be more closely related to each other than to a similar organism in another part of the world. That's my point about the golden mole, which is much more closely related to elephants, or the marsupial mole, which is much more closely related to other marsupials. We also have a mole in North America that's related to the moles in, in Asia and Europe, because again, Asia, Europe, and North America were connected for quite a long time, and that's when that type of mole evolved. I hope this is all making sense. I just wanted to kind of communicate my own experience with biogeography because I think it is very fascinating, not only in its own right for natural history, understanding the history of the world, but also what it tells us about evolution. So thank you.